It's good to be with you this morning. If you guys could stand, we're going to begin our time with a call to worship. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalms chapter 9. If we could put those verses up on the screen. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praise to the Lord and rejoice in his salvation. The Lord has made himself known. Let's worship the Lord together. Praise God from who all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.
taught this last week. Let's sing along together. across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Rory Lion, oh, be still and behold it.
take this time for us to read a, a corporate confession. If you could join me in the underlined portions. Lord, your word states that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. We acknowledge that we have no good apart from you. Yet more often than not, we are self-centered people prone to place our trust in the comforts of false security and hope in this world. Jesus, have mercy on our self-righteous hearts. You have treated us better than our sins deserve. Remind us of the weight of our sin and that we were redeemed at the cost of your blood. Lord, we believe that there is only one salvation, which is through the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And you fulfilled the law and prophets so that in you, you alone, we would find the forgiveness of sin once and for all. Jesus, remind us that our only hope is in you. When seasons of doubt arise, help us to rest in your steadfast love. Lord, you are rich in mercy and have loved us even when we were dead because of our sins. Because of Christ, we have now been adopted as sons and daughters and have been sealed for the day of redemption through the Holy Spirit. Read this together. Lord, you have clothed us in robes of righteousness because of Christ. We give you praise because you are worthy of honor and glory forever. Let's worship.
good. Your goodness never ends. Your goodness never fails. You never fail. I thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning, church. Best day ever. Amen. Awesome. I'm Dan, Dan Stephanie. I am the facility guys here, uh, guy here. Some of you I know. Some of you, hi. Um, so uh, for, first, let's just get this out of the way. I can't believe they gave me a microphone to talk to, talk to you guys, because I'm the guy running behind the scenes trying to make sure that everything's running for you all. So again, hi. Um, first time guests that are here today, we, we were expecting you to come, and um, we were set up for you. Um, to visit us at the uh, guest services. There's a table back there. It's on your way out of the doors. Just before you get to the exit doors, it's to the left. And we have a special gift for you, and we want to connect with you. Um, it's real quick. It's real easy. It's not like you're signing for a mortgage or anything, so we'll get you in and out real quick. Um, if you're here in person or even online, um, we have a 411 page on our website, and you can do it that way and get connected with us. Um, oh, and then guest services will follow up with you if you do that online so that um, we can get you connected here at the church if you're gonna call this uh, your, your new church home. We also, for the new ones, have a Discover class that happens on second services. There's three of them, and it helps you get connected, again, deeper in with the church and with other members here at the church that uh, call this place home. And uh, again, it's on the 411 page. Get used to the knowing what the 411 page is because that's where you're going to get all your information uh, out here at Riverside. Now we get to do an act of worship, and that's our offering that we give uh, to here to the church. Um, in the Old Testament, it says it's grain and, and animals. We prefer that you don't do that for us. So we've got some boxes on the outside of the uh, auditorium here that you can drop your offering in, or we have online texting and by mail, the old-fashioned way. So uh, let's pray real quick about that, because um, God's provided all that for us. Father, we just thank you for all the blessings that you provide to us every day. Father, we ask that... Uh, what comes to this church from your people, that you would bless it, that you would make it abundant, that you would put it to the use in the right places for us, Father. Well, you, know, you know best, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you smell the cookies when you came in today? Oh. And I've been here since about 6.30 this morning smelling that. But I always made my way back around to make sure I got the really good whiff over here. So good. So we are selling those for our team to go to Bolivia, a missions team. They are almost fully funded for this 
uh, for this trip. And that's one of the things they really want to do is, is make that a goal is to get fully funded before they leave next month. So please, um, because they smell so good, go visit that table. The, the suggested price for those is $20. Uh, but don't forget to tip your waitresses and waiters on their way out there also. And um, so I've been here since last October. And what I've learned is this place is really big and there's a lot of things that need to be done. So I got the okay to get somebody to help me. I was like, yes. Hey guys. And uh, the way I pray, I'm asking for like a Bob Vila to come and show up. <laughs> Maybe the Property Brothers, you know. <laughs> let's, let's get in here and do it in 30 minutes. Um, but God always has the perfect plan. And he sent me a prayer warrior. And I don't, I don't, God's so good, right? So I get this guy, his name is Kevin, and you probably all know who he is. Um, he's on our prayer team. Um, he's a biker. So I feel pretty confident when I'm walking around now. Um, but he has joined our team. If Kevin is here and close, I'll bring him up so you all can see him. If he's not, that means we got something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Jarrett has joined the team and he has already made a huge impact in what happens behind the scenes here. And I am extremely happy um, to have some of that workload lifted off, but I'm also very happy um, to make a new friend that helps me uh, do what we do for God and for this house. So. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So if you see him, go to him first instead of me. <laughs> Kidding. All right. Um, that's all I got this morning. Um, now you're going to hear the guy you really came for, Pastor Steve, to bring us another message about the Hot Mess series. Thank you and enjoy. Um, I'm not the reason we come to church, right? We come for Jesus. <laughs> Dan, I love Dan. And we we're so grateful for him and for Kevin. And um, there's a whole story about this light in my office you can ask me about sometime that it's your insight into their personalities. Uh, let me pray for us. Actually, before we do that, uh, do you guys know Carol Zeltman? Yeah, she's our staff member who never ages. Uh, you may meet her in the coffee bar or out in the lobby or on a phone call. She's our guest services coordinator. And this week, we're celebrating her 10-year anniversary on our staff. So, we will not bring her on this stage because we are afraid of her. And, um, but her love language, if you go say hi to her after the service, that will make her day. She will love that. Please seek her out and greet her and thank her. Now let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for the church, for time to gather um, from so many places, so many things going on in our lives, but time to just come and to be encouraged through your word, to encourage through fellowship and time to worship you and to remember what is true. And, and to put a stake in that and, and to mark our days from what we know is true about you. And Lord, I just ask that you'd meet us in your word and teach us from it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I spent Thursday morning uh, reading through news articles on the college campus protests 
in the US and things that are going on now in some other countries. And I've been trying to make sense of that, how we got here. And there's a viral video of a PhD candidate at Columbia University. And she was asking that um, the people who had barricaded themselves into one of the buildings on campus be allowed to bring in food from their meal plans. And it generated a lot of ridicule. And I admit, I got pulled into that. I joined in and I thought it seemed so presumptuous for people who are defying the law to also then want privileges. And then I looked up some old notes from 2016. The last time I taught this passage that we're going to be in today in 1 Corinthians about communion was July 10, 2016. That Thursday, I had been online. And a friend had posted a video on Facebook along with some very strong feelings about the video. And without knowing the background, I clicked the video. Didn't know the context, didn't know what I was about to see, but I saw two policemen holding a man on the ground and there was panic and yelling. And then one officer pulls out a pistol and shoots. And the camera bounces around, there's more gunshots. And eventually I realized I'm watching this guy um, die. And I just sat there stunned. I, thought, I just watched a man die. I didn't know what had happened to lead up to that. I did know that people would give very differing accounts of what they saw in that video. And I knew there'd be more misunderstanding and more anger and more fear. And my heart was sick. Uh, I knew that that man, his name was Alton, he was dead. I knew that his family was in pain. I knew that I had friends, real friends, who would interpret that event very differently. I had friends who didn't know about it. I had friends who would want to not judge it without being there, without more information. And I had friends who would see it as one more version of the same story, overly aggressive police responding uh, because of Alton's color. And we have friends who wear badges, who do their best to process these kinds of events, who put on a uniform and also follow Jesus. And I stood on the platform that week as trying to make sense of people who are trying to hold the trust of the ones who are, they are sworn to protect. That was 2016. I was a pastor at a very diverse church right outside Atlanta. And these events that would play out in the media in faraway places, they felt very close there. And we had to talk about it. And I, I was thinking this week, these college campus protests and the mobs and the crackdowns and the cleanouts, it can feel so far away. But the views behind those things and the concerns of those students, of other students, of faculty, of citizens, of the police, the officials, the news people, those concerns all exist in this room. And any view out there that you think isn't also in here, then at most it's only one relationship away from you. Somebody you know has a very different view. And if they don't, then somebody you know knows somebody you know has a very different view of what's going on in the world. I used to coach youth soccer. Uh, one of my players was from Lebanon. And her brother, and I think about this a lot lately because she represents something to me. I never met her brother, uh, but I knew he was angry. And he hated Israel, hated. And through the years I had with her, we brought her into the church. She made a decision for Christ. But her Instagram now, my daughter still keep up with her online. It would say she's not following Jesus now. And as I process where we are right now and how many of us struggle to distinguish uh, what we do and don't think about Israel and what they should and should not do to defend themselves and how to make sense of the hate that seems to go beyond protesting their policies and hate sometimes just for Jewish people. I keep thinking about my little soccer player who's now the age of those student protesters and how did Jesus ever expect us to get past that kind of generational hate? He knew there would be difficulties. His church he set it up for this. His church was going to go to the ends of the earth, highways and hedges, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he commanded. If you do what he said, you end up with people in the same room who used to hate each other and used to hate each other's families and everything they represent. How are we supposed to do that? How do you do that? Pull people 
from such different backgrounds and worldviews and become one community through Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. He came first to the Jewish people. From early in his preaching, his message started to include other groups, people like Samaritans. It's an ethnic branch out of Judaism. To an outsider, you would look at the two groups and go, they're the same. But internally, there was a lot of hate between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. And then there were tax collectors. Those are Jewish people who chose to work for the opposition government. They were hated among their own people group. And then there's women and there's children. There's rich people, poor people, slaves. There's demon-possessed people who had been demon-possessed or free of that or coming in. There's foreigners, there's prostitutes and lepers, criminals like Paul. If it was 2024, there'd be some addicts thrown in there. Jesus included religious and political zealots, the kinds of people who would have occupied buildings and the ones who would have had the bullhorns. Jews, Greeks, North Africans, Ethiopians, and Romans, Roman soldiers, the wearers of badges. And he told each one that he loved us. And he made one church, one people, with nothing in common, and no reason to even speak to each other except him now. And the price of entry into his new community is your willingness to leave your old identity at the cross and take up a new one. Him, Jesus, it's our identity now. We sinners who were born of one ancient sinful father, Adam, are now reborn into one new family in Christ. To be Christian is to be the brother or sister of every other Christian including all the ones who still have sin in their lives like you do, or all the ones who are sometimes wrong, all the ones who make mistakes or vote wrong or don't vote or vote twice or protest the wrong things or they protest no thing. The church is the sinners redeemed by Jesus and made one community in the Holy Spirit through the grace of God. You read that with me? This is my best shot this week. The church is the sinners redeemed by Jesus and made one community in the Holy Spirit through the grace of God. That is not easy. Living as one people is not automatic. That only happens as we see ourselves the way that God does and we see other people the same way. In this room, any given weekend, in here and online, we worship together. Immigrant, native, rich, poor, English, English is second language, from the New England, the Midwest, the West Coast, the East Coast, Southern, Canadian, Floridian, Indian, Haitian, Cuban, Egyptian, Guatemalan, Peruvian, and multiple shades of brown. We didn't do that on our own. We're not capable. This only happens because Jesus started a new community under his banner. But I mentioned there's a cost for entry. You have to humble yourself, bow to him, and repent. You're a sinner who needs a savior. And he is more than willing and able to save you. You just ask him. And once we've done that, we bow to him. You take up your new identity, born again into his family now. One of the ways he told us to mark that decision, to celebrate our death to our old selves and this rebirth into new life in him was this here in the book of John in the New Testament, chapter six. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. (laughs) You ever think about this thing we do? That was hard. That was a hard teaching. And the day Jesus said it, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So why would he say something like that? Why would he tell us to eat Jesus? 
There were rumors in the early church in that time period that the Christians were cannibals because there were rumors that they would eat the body of their Savior. And that caused some really big fights in the church about what exactly is this thing he told us to do? Does the bread and the wine that we take at the Lord's Supper or communion, does that save you? Is it real flesh and blood? Is that what we're really saying? Is this Eucharist, communion? Uh, the Lord's Supper, it, does it have to be wine? Some of you are thinking, does it get to be wine? <laughs> this teaching was difficult, and it continued to be difficult, but this is what Jesus set up, and I believe it is a part to the key of unity in his church, and we need unity, right? The reminder that our ban- that's the banner we're under, period. My identity is in him. So why do we eat the body of Jesus? Why do we do communion? If you got a Bible with you, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today, the back half of it. Over the next four weeks, we're gonna wind out this whole series in Corinthians. I'm gonna skip a little bit of the very end, but I'll set you up for that when we do it, and we'll probably do parts of it out of order. But today, we're at the end of chapter 11. You can work your way down there. This is in the second half of your Bible the part that explains the coming of Jesus over here at book number, what is that, five, six, seven, if you're scrolling. You can download a Bible. There's free ones out in the lobby. I think we've got at least two languages out there, but if you download, there's a whole bunch of other languages. Let's start with a statement. And there's gonna be four of these. So you list takers, there's your hint. Um, And and then we'll unpack it as we go through the passage. We celebrate communion because communion represents our utter dependence on Jesus. It's part of why he sets it up. We don't actually eat his body. Some of you could be relieved. Um, The day he said what he said, he also alluded to the bread that God provided for his people Israel when he took them out of Egypt way back in the book of Exodus when they were enslaved there and how that bread provided for them so they could live and now his bread which he is will let you live forever in that same passage he he describes it like this he says I am before he says you have to take my body he says I am the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness that's that bread that showed up on the ground in the mornings and they died this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then the night he was going to be arrested, they were celebrating the Jewish Passover meal, a meal where you ate a lamb, a lamb whose blood had been used for centuries. Uh, That lamb that you would eat, you use the blood of that lamb to mark the doorpost and the beam of your house, uh, which is what was done in, do they still mark it when you do the Passover? You don't anymore, do you? No. That's what it was done when God took his people out of Egypt and then to celebrate, they would still, they still eat that lamb because its blood symbolically covered over their sin. It let them live. It, the angel of death passed over that house. And so when Jesus ate that meal with him that night, he applies that to himself. He's saying, I am the lamb of God. He told him like the man in the wilderness, I am the bread of God. I am the lamb of God. We need him like we need bread. Without partaking of his life, we will die. We don't literally eat his life, but his life is the sacrifice that gives us life. Communion represents our utter dependence on Jesus and communion creates community. At least it should. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, we find the Corinthians are celebrating communion, the bread and the cup, and they're doing it at every meal that they shared together when they gathered, which seems pretty normal in the New Testament. That it was something that was done often, not just once a month or wherever. When they were gathering, they were doing this. It makes us think we should probably do it more often, and even more so in our small groups more often. It seems when you read through it in Corinthians, it was less of a ritual and more of a moment taking during their time together where bread and wine would be present anyway and they would pause and give thanks and 
and celebrate and be reminded. And think about that. There wouldn't have been a priest there who blessed it and turned it into real flesh and blood. It it was more about what it meant to them and stopping and thanking him for being our bread of life and being living water. To pause and recount what Jesus did and take a bite together. If they had been doing it right, that's what it would have been. But in chapter 11... Uh, Paul starts the chapter by praising them for remembering him and for keeping the traditions. But when you get down to verse 17, he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. There's a problem in the way that they're gathering. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you and I believe it in part For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. That's bad. That escalates really fast. First Paul points out there's disunity, there's factions even when they gather as the church. And then he says, I suppose that's fitting so at least we can tell which ones are actual Christians. Who's genuine? There's some snark in there. And he continues, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Whatever it is you think you're doing, he's telling them, you're not doing it. That's not how you are supposed to do it. You guys are making a mess of it. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. This thing, and he's not being hyperbolic there. They were getting drunk. This thing we do to remember our dependence on Jesus and humility and to create community, they were doing it really wrong. One got nothing even to eat And another indulged so far he got drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? In other words, can't you be idiots at home? When we gather together, wait on each other. That's harsh, but it was a big deal. It was communion. This was the Lord's Supper. This is this thing he told us to do to remember. Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No. No. I will not. Communion was for everybody. It tied them together. And apparently, um, some were poor. There's an indication here that they may have even, that meal may have been the meal that they came together as the church. They kind of needed that bread. It wasn't just uniting them. It was feeding some. And others couldn't even be bothered to wait on them, to share, to make sure the needs were met. Some overindulge. They were gluttonous with the wine. I think we've lost something in the way we do communion. We won't be able to restore all that in the big room, but in your homes and in our small groups, you can. Many of our life groups, um, you share meals before you start. It's a big deal to break bread together. I would encourage you, when you're breaking bread, sometimes pause and remember why we do all this. And how often Jesus used food to remind us of who he is, the bread of life, the lamb of God, living water. And when you're in those groups, pass around one loaf, because we eat from one loaf, Jesus. Not a separate loaf for this group or that group. Eating together is intimate. We all need food. Eating together breaks down barriers. It connects us. You think about the people that you tear, you touch the same loaf of bread. It's hard to hate each other for long when you do that. It's kind of like I'm trusting you a little bit to not have leprosy. And think about all the decision that you see in the news or online or in the socials. What I find when I sit at a table with somebody and we share a meal, we get past all that really quick. And if you think about this racially for a minute, I used to hear that most people of this color have never had a person of that color in their house. I think, to a large degree, some of that's still true. You should take that as a challenge. Break bread with someone different than you, whether that's color or class or culture or generation. Matt likes to talk about diversifying your dinner table. Look for those ways as a challenge. Wow, are there people who wouldn't be sure they're welcome in my house? And I know them and they're my brother or sister in Christ. We can fix that. We should change that. And it, it pulls down a lot of other barriers when you start to share food with each other. And if you're Christians, 
Practice communion during that meal. Serve it to each other. It's really difficult to hate people after you serve communion to each other. It's pretty profound. What it brings us back to is like, I am here only by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and so are you. I can get past an awful lot of other things when that basis is clarified. Communion creates unity. It's actually stronger than that. It creates unity. It unites us. This is where the word's from. It's common unity or ownership. It's the idea of they had shared things together. Imagine if the Christians in the United States 200 years ago, put yourself back there, what is that? 1824-ish? Imagine if Christians back then, instead of creating denominations for different color groups, what if we had sat next to each other and professed that we both need Jesus and that you held a loaf of bread and I tore a piece off and then I held it for you and you tore a piece off and we dipped it in the same cup and we ate. Just imagine how different our history would be if we had just just the Christians had said, we will break bread together as brothers and sisters, period. How long do you think evils like slavery and segregation would persist if we had fed each other the body of our Savior and sat together at his feet? It, It tends to clarify things. I read the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass a few years ago. Has anybody read this? It was written in the 1840s by an escaped slave. And he explains the corrupted gospel of the slave regions and his own understanding of who Jesus actually is. That same year, I read a book called The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Dutch Christian whose family decided that they would share their home with any human who needed help. That led to them being arrested by the Nazis and put in a concentration camp, her whole family. One thing Corrie Ten Boom and Frederick Douglass had in common is that the evil that they saw around them only worked when you could see another person as a non human. And in both of their lives, that kind of evil, that view can't survive the gospel. The gospel breaks that. Once you learn that we become one family through one savior and we remind ourselves of it by sharing communion, you you can't see that person as anything other than human. If you want to overcome the misunderstandings that happen when people aren't used to people who are different than them, if you want to overcome the tensions between authorities and police and civilians and colors and languages and backgrounds and education and classes and ages, then we share our dependence on Jesus to serve communion to one another. I mean, seriously, do that in your small groups. Do it in your, that in your homes. There's no room at the cross for pride or ego or anything that makes me think I'm better than you or worse than you. The cross exposes what we are, the same. Humans who need Jesus for life itself. And Jesus told us to celebrate that together by taking his body and his blood, the bread and the wine, and sharing it. I would challenge us as a church to find ways to do that outside of Sunday mornings and diversify your dinner table at your small groups when you eat together or in homes, apartments. It doesn't have to be formal. You just set aside some bread and some grape juice or some wine, your big kids. If you have Jewish Christian friends, kick it up a notch. Share Passover with them someday. See if they'd set that up for next year and then let them explain that and how Jesus now is the lamb. Uh, When you do take communion in your groups with friends or with your family or with your kids, you can use this passage. It's the next verse here in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's a way to do it. Paul tells them they're doing it wrong and then he comes back and he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered from you. He's not making this up. He's passing on to them. This is the way we do this thing. This is what Jesus said. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, we don't actually eat his actual flesh. He used bread. He's representing him. And the bread and the cup don't save us. Jesus saves us. This is my body, which for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, 
do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The cup is the new covenant, the new testament, the new promise, the new contract. A covenant was a blood oath in the Old Testament. Uh, You took an animal and it was sacrificed, you cut it apart, and the two parties of this binding contract pass through the parts. Jesus is the sacrifice for the new covenant that we have now. His blood is the new covenant, a blood oath between God and us. The deal from God is trust my son and you can be my son or daughter. Trust my son, you enter my family. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion celebrates the past, what Jesus did for us. It also celebrates the promise. In Matthew 26, he he explains that he will one day drink the cup with us again. Here, he explains he will come back for us. This is not home. Communion reminds us of home. And to long for it. One day he will do this with us in heaven. We will feast with him. It reminds us of what awaits. That the stuff we deal with here he has paid for. And one day we will be reunited with him. This isn't home. The Corinthians had forgotten that. They were using communion to indulge themselves. To humiliate and divide instead of love and unify. Because of that, and this next part's hard... Uh, Some of them were sick, and some of them had died. They were abusing the table of the Lord, and they were being actively disciplined by God for it. There's no way to soft pedal that. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. The body is Jesus. It's the body of Christ, but it's also the body, the church. There is some introspection and some reflection about the whole, the other brothers and sisters. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. We just let that set for a minute. This is a passage we, we dodge because you don't know quite what that means. I can't look at your life and say, oh, you got pneumonia, that's caused you to communion. <laughs> but if you read through it, Paul's saying maybe that it could, there could be discipline going on in your life because of the way you've disrespected the body and blood of Jesus and the way it should unify the brothers and sisters and how important and foundational this is to the church. God may be bringing discipline into your life because you've, taken that for granted, or I I don't know. That's complicated, right? But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. If you take time and look at your own life before you take it, then we don't have to worry about that. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. He loves us. He brings things sometimes to help us change the path that we're on. This is a strong warning. When you take communion in a way that humiliates people Jesus loves, it doesn't mean you don't take it as a sinner. We, of course you take it as a sinner. We, we, we take it with gratitude and we take it in a way that doesn't humiliate other people who Jesus loves. Like, Jesus, I take your body and blood. Thank goodness I'm not like that other people group over there that I hate so much. You may need to deal with your heart a minute before you follow through on that. Or you, you take it in a way that's unworthy of what it means that I depend on him for life itself, then you invite discipline. That's a big deal. Some churches will say, we only want you to take communion if you're saved, and that's true, but that's on you. If you're not saved, you're already in trouble. I think the bigger warning there is for believers. Communion is uh, time to reflect on your own relationships. Are you demeaning people that Jesus loves? Are you celebrating his forgiveness while you harbor unforgiveness in yourself? Communion reminds us of what our friends mean to God. The Corinthians were under judgment because they ignored each other. They were ignoring not only those who had needs, but they were um, indulging themselves without 
thinking of it. Apparently, nobody was calling each other out on it, in particular the poor. Uh, my daughter is in the Peruvian rainforest this week. Thursday morning, she sent us these words. She said, the hotel is almost at the heart of town overlooking the tiny slum city. The first night we arrived, we were looking out at the mismatched tin roofs that have been barely secured and are rusted with time. The number of roofs and their subsequent different colors almost threatened a beautiful scene. People were saying, que chever, or how cool. Um, I think unable to comprehend that these tin roofs are poverty. There's nothing cool about a roof that leaks every time it rains. It's not beautiful that the smell of trash Dirty stray dogs and urine fill the stores and the cramped one-room houses. Nothing cool about a child walking alone in the streets holding a newborn like a rag doll. Each person living next to the trash under the tin roof is a story. Dios, or God, died for all these tin roofs. It's critical to remember this. Each roof is a human. Muy importante a Dios. Entonces importante a mí. Very important to God. Therefore, important to me. It's part of what communion does for us. It reminds us the value that my brother and sister has before God. That person is really important to God. That means they're important to me. The escaped slave, Frederick Douglass, he added an appendix to his first book so that he could emphasize in the appendix that his criticism of the way he saw the gospel lived out in the slave states, the, his criticisms of that religion weren't the same as criticizing his great hope and his savior, Jesus. Uh, it's just the way they were doing it was really twisted. And he wanted an appendix so he could say, hey, I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the way they're practicing it. It's not so different than what's happening in Corinthians. They were abusing what they've been given as a gift. And Douglas clarifies that for the free slave, the answer was Jesus. Corey Tinboom, she didn't have a plan. They just decided they will love anybody who knocks on their door. And they did. And after she and her sister were uh, transferred to the concentration camp, they smuggled in part of a Bible and they started a Bible study in their barrack. They even prayed secretly with one of the Nazi officers who one day felt like he was trapped. The answer for them in that persecution and oppression, the answer was Jesus. We wonder sometimes as we look around the world, I do, how we make peace and find common ground. The answer is the same. It's been the same for a long time. It's Jesus. As you read about the college campuses around the U.S., something you may miss at first, if you just read about what's happening now, you may miss the baptisms that happened in April at places like Auburn, or there were events in arenas like the University of Georgia recently, which led to hundreds of baptisms. They were unexpected, so they didn't have anywhere to baptize them, so they started baptizing people in the back of pickup trucks, college campuses. God's moving there, too, in the midst of these things, and communion represents our utter dependence on Christ. It creates community, reminds us of home, to long for it, and it reminds us of what our friends mean to God, others. So before we close today, we want to take a minute to practice this thing that Jesus gave us. And at first, I want to open up the prayer benches. These are up here at the front. You can use those whenever. Uh, but in particular, today, it's a great place if you need some time to pray, to grieve, to confess. Maybe God used the time we've had here to surface some hurt or bitterness or unforgiveness Maybe surfers joy or thanksgiving in your own life. Know that you can come here and pray. And if you want, someone from our prayer team will join you and pray with you. And then we're going to open up the table. There's three up here in the front and there's one, two, three, four along the back. Uh, we're going to do it a little differently today. I'm going to ask you in a moment to come get what you need and go back to your seat. And we're going to wait and then we'll all take it together in just a few minutes. So once I open it, the, the ones up here, you tear off the loaves and there's individual cups. The ones back there are the prepackaged ones, so everything is in the one little container. And we're gonna go back to our seats and then we will take it together in just a few moments, okay? So make your way to the tables now and I'll take us the next step in just a minute.
so many times in my life, um, these moments as we wait on each other are a time to, to just watch and remember and look at all the stories that walk around the room and be reminded to pray for people that maybe haven't thought about lately or people who couldn't walk a few weeks ago and just walked up and took communion today. Um, it should bring us together. So let me walk through this passage together and we'll do this as he does it. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So do that now. Take the bread. Thank him for his body, his life. Bread of life, the lamb of God. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So do that now. And let me pray for us, and we'll sing together. God, we're grateful for... Um, just so many things, Lord. Today, I find myself very grateful for your people, the people with whom I share this meal so often. And I'm reminded, Lord, that you're our hope. You're it. You're all that matters. The words you say about us, what you say, is all that matters. And God, I pray that you just remind us often through communion to the humility with which we come to you. And give me those eyes for the people around me in the world, Lord. It's so easy to get caught up in the anger on the internet and miss sight of all the souls that you long to know you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God from whom blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father.
blessing flows one more time. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want to read this benediction for us, which is a blessing for the road of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Go in peace.